Welcome to Generation Gap Sports Cat <laughs> 7. A look in the wide world of sports is seen through the colorful <laughs> eyes of a gang of six. Ranging in age from 25 to 70, we take you on a journey to sports heaven, discussing everything from the real to the nonsensical. We're family, and like in any family, when we don't all bleed the same colors, well, the talk can get personal. So here we go with Sportscast 7. Uncorked, unvarnished, unrestrained, unrepentant, unseemly, and utterly unlike anything you've ever experienced before. Let's meet the family. From oldest to youngest, we've got Bob, yours truly, John, Charlie, Bobby, Benny, and Nick. All right, let's dig in, guys. Every championship Major League Baseball team needs two ingredients. They need a bomber, and they need a flamethrower. So, tonight we're talking about flamethrowers. Charlie, who's the guy in the mound that's going to take you down the lane to the best pitcher of all time? Well, I have not watched a full regular season Major League Baseball game in over 30 years. So my definition of the best pitcher has nothing to do with wins and losses or ERA. It has to do with being interesting and compelling, someone that I want to pay attention to. So over my years as a sports fan, two guys stood out. First one... Six foot three, his record, career record was 29 and 19, 3.1 ERA, 170 strikeouts, two time All Star, AL Rookie of the Year in 76. He was known for talking to the ball, strutting around the mound in circles, strangely manicuring the cleat marks on the mound and not allowing the groundskeeper to do the same. He finished two, he, he pitched two 11 inning complete games, which tells you more about the game itself than it does necessarily about him and how the game has changed. But uh, his nickname was The Bird. That was Mark Fidrich. Mark was a, just a, a damn interesting guy for someone who's not in the weeds about baseball. The other guy, a little more recently, pitched from 1989 to 1999. Uh, his record not quite as stellar, 87 and 108, 4.25 ERA. He was born without a right hand, and that's Jim Abbott. So to me, those are the two best pitchers of all time because they captured my interest. Very, very interesting, intriguing explanation there, Charlie. Let's stay in your immediate family. Nick, what do you got to say about this? Um, well, it's a very compelling case. You can start us off with. Um, I too will will stick to a pitcher that um, I watched very closely during his prime. Um, that is El Grande, um, you know, one of the great finesse pitchers in baseball, um, Pedro Martinez. Um, and I know that some of you might be questioning how I was watching him, um, you know, for for much of my formative years, but um, I can sense that I was I was there for a lot of it. Um, anyway. Some stats, three-time Cy Young winner um, from 97 to 2003, had an ERA of 1.98, um, incredibly stellar. Two of those years were 1.9. Um, something else to uh, just think about in the context of this is this is during the steroid era. So he was he was putting up crazy numbers against guys who were juiced up. Um, super compelling, you know, a, a guy who – you know, had heat, but also had, you know, had touch, um, kind of similar to our, our NBA champion from last night. Um, Pedro Martinez, look around it. He's my, he's my pick for greatest pitcher of all time. Pedro Martinez, very colorful player. Very, very, very good fastball and a slider. All right, Benny, what's your call? So I'm not sure, uh, what happened with Charlie there? I think he might be under the influence a little bit to start. I uh, apologize for our listeners and watchers out there. Um, yeah, in terms of his son, though, who seemed to have inherited more intellect in this conversation, um, 
you know, I will say that, yeah, I think Pedro Martinez has got to be the greatest pitcher of all time. So I agree with Nick, which is a rarity on the show. So this is, this means something, uh, um, you know, when you look at baseball and pitching, the main thing you have to look at, I think the most important stat is your earn run average. Um, and so when it comes to ERA, Pedro Martinez is the only pitcher in baseball history that has led the entire baseball league, major league baseball with the best ERA five times. No one else has, has led the league five times. Um, Walter Johnson did it four times. Fred Maddox did it four times. Uh, but, you know, he's done it five. And in terms of Walter Johnson, you also have to remember, like, Walter Johnson played in an era where you really didn't play as many teams. Um, you know, you're pretty much sticking to whether you're in the National League or American League. You know, Pedro Martinez was playing everyone, and he played in the steroid era. He played at a level of baseball that was highly integrated where you have people from all over the world coming in to play, whether Latin America, you know, Negro league players were obviously not separated in Pedro Martinez era, unlike it was for, you know, Walter Johnson. Um, you know, so I think this is something that we really have to look at. Um, you know, Cy Young's are important stat. Obviously Pedro Martinez won it three times. Um, other pitchers have won it more. But I will say that the Cy Young, again, is a award that's broken up based on the, depending on what league you're in. So it's not an award that represents your, you know, being the lead leaguer, you know, the best pitcher in all of baseball. It's the best pitcher in your particular league. So America League or National League. So really, I think the only way to compare pitchers across era is based on how much you dominated your own era. And by looking at, you know, how many times you led the league in ERA. Uh, I think that's the best way of going about it. So I got to go with Pedro Martinez as well. Wow. Two for Pedro. Bobby, what's your take on this? So I got a little ambitious here. I actually put together a top 100. And the again, it was pretty close at the top, uh, but I ended on Walter Johnson. Um, and yeah, he he you know, led the majors in ERA four times, but he was also a two-time MVP, three-time triple crown winner for pitchers, which means you led the majors in ERA wins and strikeouts. He led the majors in strikeouts 12 times, which is a major league record, including eight straight. And I think that is actually the most important stat for a pitcher as far as dominance goes is strikeouts. You can have a good ERA if you have a really good defense behind you. They can help clean up, you know, some mistakes. Uh, if you're striking guys out, you're dominating them. You don't need any help from anybody else, you know, other than the catcher to a degree. But you are completely dominating the hitter if you're striking them out. And he did it 12 times as far as leading the majors in most strikeouts. Just absolutely ridiculous. Um also, you know, led the majors in wins six times, and he has a record for most shutouts in a career, 110, and it's not even close. The next highest is Grover Cleveland Alexander with 90. Um, so put all that together, and Walter Johnson is number one all time. You make a pretty compelling case for Walter Johnson, although none of us ever saw him throw. That, that's, that's pretty cool, the stats he had. Bob, obviously, you've had the advantage of seeing a lot more baseball than anyone else has here. Certainly, you've got an interesting read on this. What is it? Thanks, John. Uh, I do. Um, I, I figured that uh, that Bobby would be the, the master of the stats and would land on Walter Johnson. And I, I wasn't going to duplicate that. Uh, I think my approach splits the difference a little bit between some of the philosophies that have already been uh, put forth on this question. Uh, but I'm going to go with somebody that Bobby did mention uh, among those uh, he talked about, and that's Grover Cleveland Alexander. And let me run down a few things concerning uh, Cleveland. He was overshadowed by Walter Johnson, uh, with whom his career overlapped uh, considerably. And that's uh, perhaps the reason uh, he hasn't gotten quite the acclaim uh, that I would argue he, he deserves. His career winning percentage was 642, pretty good in baseball, 13% of his games resulted in shutouts. Uh, I would add that in the 1915 season, 
He had a ludicrous 1.22 ERA in 49 games. Um, in the uh, Later in his career, in the 1926 uh, World Series, uh, he won uh, game two, he won game six, and came out and saved game seven. So that the uh, the Cardinals, for whom he pitched at the time, would win the World Series. That, to uh, truth and lending here, that was the only uh, time he won the World Series, but he appeared in several. Uh, he won the National League pitching triple crown, so-called, leading the league in strikeouts, uh, ERA, and victories three times. Uh, as uh, Bobby mentioned, he had 90 shutouts uh, over his career. Um, he was a nine had a 985 fielding percentage as a pitcher, which is phenomenal. That's gold glove material um, by, uh, by any measure. Uh, so it's a pretty phenomenal career, but, but wait, there's still more. Uh, in the 10 year span from 1912 to 1921, he four times led the National League in ERA, five times in wins, six times in strikeouts, five times in complete games, five times in shutouts, and as I mentioned, three times won the Triple Crown. And here's the frosting on the cake. He gave up one of his prime seasons at the peak of his career, 1918, to go serve in World War I in the European theater, where he was badly wounded by artillery, uh, gassed by the enemy for the rest of his life. He felt the effects uh, of his service in, uh, uh, in the European theater. He suffered from uh, epile epilepsy uh, and PTSD, as we would now call it, uh, and uh, became an alcoholic. Uh, remained an alcoholic uh, for much of the remainder of his career, and yet uh, put together a career that was phenomenal. And one last thing, yes, indeed, none of us saw these guys play, but we actually have a connection to somebody who did. And John is uh, the one most likely to uh, to remember. Um, uh, he was an uncle by uh, <coughs> um, marriage, uh, Edward Johnson, uh, who was married to uh, our Aunt Annie, Edward Johnson also served in World War I, spent most of it playing baseball. During that uh, period, he faced Grover Cleveland and Alexander. Um, Edward Johnson was a pretty good hitter in his time and a big man, about 6'4", um, significant stature uh, at that time. Uh, he talked about his the time he faced Grover, Alex, uh, Grover Cleveland and Alexander and mentioned that, in fact, he struck out. <laughs> uh, but in, we do have eyewitness testimony uh, that we can bring to bear uh, in terms of uh, uh, Grover Cleveland Alexander's greatness. Thank you. Wow, you make a strong case for him. That's pretty cool. You know, I, I had to go through the pitchers that I can remember best from watching on TV. And they Certainly Pedro Martinez is one of them. Uh, Roger Clemens comes to mind, but I think he's got a bit of a tainted history. Then you go back to guys like Sandy Koufax, Bob Gibson, and, and I, I – the guy really popped in my head was Nolan Ryan, tremendous pitcher. But I'm going to go all the way back to Cy Young himself. There's a guy who kind of set the early stage for what it was going to be, to be a tremendous pitcher. The guy was a giant physically at his back in his day. He was 6'2", 215 pounds, very imposing. He's one of the first true superstars from a pitching standpoint in Major League Baseball history. So he's my man. All right. I'm sure all you guys are imbibing of some sort of refreshment right now. Charlie, you want to introduce us to the drinking portion of our segment tonight? Yeah. So let's uh let's let's go up the alcohol scale. Does anybody have anything less than five percent alcohol by volume? Two of you do. Ben, what you got? Well, uh, today, friends, I have with me um, all the way from uh, one of our homelands, uh, Germany, it comes to our ancestral roots. Um, this is a Verns Gruner Pills legend. Um, you can get it at Aldi's, um, not very expensive. It's 4.9% alcohol uh, per volume. And um, yeah, it's uh, pretty, pretty solid. You know, you could, it's one of those things where after a, a hard days of work, you know, for those of us who actually do have jobs, um, you know, you can kick back and drink a little bit of Wernsgruner as uh, the good old Germans do. So, <laughs> yep. <clears throat> well, it's a pretty good app. You might want to seek them out as a sponsor. Uh, I'm sure they're going to be calling us soon. So stay yeah. tuned. <laughs> yep. Nick, I think you raised your hand. I did. I did. I've got this um, 
It's beer out of St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, comes in a fairly platinum blue can, some nice kind of ornaments on the front. Um, it's a Budweiser light. Um, so we all know they've been embroiled in some it's rather annoying uh, controversy, um, but I will still consider myself a loyalist uh, of Bud Light. Um, it's a crisp all year round. So I'm sure they appreciated your purchase. Yes, they, they probably did. <laughs> Although I think they're still the number two sold beer in America, uh, recently overtaken by Modelo, surprisingly. Yeah, I saw that too. That was a surprise. Yeah. Said right. uh four percent, right, Charlie? I said uh below five. Yeah, okay. I had to look I had to look it up because I wasn't sure. Yep. I am at four percent here uh -huh. with uh Labat Blue uh -huh. representing Canada, brewed in John's Newfoundland. And uh figured since a Canadian finally won the RBC for the first time since I believe 1954. Shout out uh Canada a little bit. Did you actually watch? I watched some highlights and I saw the viral video of the guy getting tackled. So <laughs> I feel like I saw most of most of the content. You saw what you needed to see. Yeah. All right. Anybody uh between like five and eight? Or are the rest of us all going for the uh the hard stuff? John, what do you have? Well, I'm not gonna say it's hard, but I will say this is delicious. I'm enjoying a glass of Malbec. This particular Malbec comes from a family winery in Argentina that was founded back in 1902, the Cantina Alta. Uh, it's really a fantastic red wine. For those of you who want something that's got a lot of flavor to red wine, but maybe not quite as, we'll say, as strong tasting as maybe a Cabernet or a Zinfandel, uh, this is really nice stuff. It's, it's a real treat to drink this, and later tonight, I will be enjoying this with some uh, wonderful grilled chicken. So here's to uh, Malbec in Argentina. 13.5% by volume. All right. Sounds delicious, John. Bobby, what you got going on? My turn. <laughs> My turn, Charlie. Oh, Bob's. Yeah. Pretty, pretty cut off, Charlie. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I've had a few too many. <laughs> All right. Well, tonight, something special tonight. Uh yeah. Something for the refined palate, uh, a Chardonnay from the Con Crum uh, Winery in Bulgaria. Uh, this was bottled in 2012. I've been saving it because I bought it in 2012. Knew it would age well. Um, the uh, namesake of the winery, uh, the Khan, ruler of Bulgaria by the name of Crum, in the early uh, 9th century was famous for fashioning the cranium of a defeated enemy, Nicephorus, the emperor of Byzantium. Uh, after defeated in battle, he was beheaded and they turned his uh, skull into a drinking gourd. Uh, and uh, that was a reflection of Con Crum's refinement. And that's still uh, captured, I think, in the ambiance of the uh, of the wine today. Uh, I would note that uh, scores were always settled in those days. 200 years later, a uh, Byzantine emperor returned the favor, uh, defeated a Bulgarian army took 10,000 prisoners, had 9,999 of them uh, had their eyes gouged out, uh, left the remaining soldier with one eye so he could lead the rest of them home. Uh, the uh, Khan of Bulgaria at that point supposedly had a heart attack uh, when his forces returned. So anyway, uh, so there's some interesting backstory. It's, a, it's an interesting winery and it's 12.5% uh, alcohol by volume. All right. Sounds good. And lastly, um... Nick and I were at a wedding in November, and it was in, uh, the wedding was uh, in Southwest Michigan. We took the opportunity to have dinner at the Journeyman Distillery in Three Oaks, Michigan. <laughs> Tonight, I'm enjoying the Buggy Whip Wheat Whiskey. So it's, it's a whiskey made with a mash bill, which is 100% wheat, actually sourced entirely for Michigan. Um, they have a really cool facility. They repurposed an old factory that made buggy whips and they also made uh, corsets for women's dresses. So um, 
I happened to meet the owner of this place last uh, last fall. He told me about it. We went there, had a great dinner. Uh, my wife Wendy and I did a, did a tasting, which was pretty enjoyable. And this was one of our favorites. Um, it's a weeded whiskey. You can definitely taste the wheat. It's got a different flavor to it from other whiskeys and bourbons. And um, it's a 90, 90 proof. So uh, this is my sec my second bottle. Not, not just today, but in general that I'm working on. So um, normally I don't go through them that fast, but I like this one. So highly recommended to all of you. And that's what we're drinking tonight. Okay. Thanks for the update and the drinking there, Charlie. Bob, I know you've been talking about gouging eyes. I'm a little concerned about somebody who's drinking the old Chardonnay like that. <laughs> but, uh, I presume it tastes like something better than just your typical uh, bottled vinegar. Uh, indeed. indeed. All right. But anyway, let's let's lead right back to you. What is going on in sort of the uh, the offbeat, lesser known part of the sports world today? Uh, not so offbeat, but lesser known to uh, many, but very well known to some. Uh, the uh, two things. Uh, last uh, Sunday... In the 156th renewal of the Yale Harvard Regatta, known in Greater Cambridge as the Harvard Yale Regatta, um, Yale beat Harvard uh, on the Connecticut River um, to uh, retain their crown uh, in that event. It's, as I said, the 156th renewal, which makes it one of the very oldest sustained college athletic events uh, in, uh, in U.S. history. Uh, meanwhile, we are just approaching the climactic uh, moment for the college baseball season. Uh, the uh, final eight, as they go to the World Series, College World Series, so-called in, uh, in Omaha, include Virginia, Stanford, Tennessee, Wake Forest, Florida, TCU, Oral Roberts, and LSU. Um, and uh, incidentally, a Stanford pitcher uh, the other day, in a testament to uh, stamina and questionable good sense, uh, through 156 pitches uh, in a game uh, that went into extra innings to, uh, to to defeat Texas. And as it is, it was only due to a fluke uh, dropped fly ball that was lost in the lights that uh, Stanford emerged from the uh, Super Regional last week to make it to the World Series. All right. You know, Charlie, I've been uh, trying to keep an eye on our predictions, and I'm not sure anyone's having a particularly good uh, – spring summer when it comes to picking uh winners uh can you get, give us a review of what's what our most latest round looked like and what's coming up next in terms of what we should be uh predicting well our most recent prediction was for the indianapolis 500 and um we didn't do too badly we picked the second fourth and fifth finishers benny uh picked marcus erickson who was in second I picked Alex Pillow, who finished fourth. Bob picked Alex Rossing, who finished fifth. John, you um, went with Helio Castroneves, who finished 15th. And then um, our least successful predictor was Bobby, who named Patricio Award, who came in 24th. Um, now, there could be a little controversy here. I know we wanted to put in place some sort of consequence for the person whose prediction was the worst. You could probably debate whether Bobby, by picking Patricio in 24th, or Nick, who did not make a prediction, should be facing tonight's consequence. Uh, I would like to vote that they both face consequences, Charlie. I'd I would second that motion. Do we have a third? Third. I think John us. is motioning. I, think John... I, 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 I have a third, and then I have a, I have a thought. Once you introduce what the punishment punishment is, okay. And that's I mean that's three against two. So, so uh, you know, uh, father, what is your take on this? Do we finish them in in a Mortal Kombat style? And he's muted. So I guess I'll that take those. Yes. He said definitely yes. Yeah. He's muted. So that's a yes. That's <laughs> overwhelming. There. That, that, that is 
that is two thirds of the eligible voters. All right. So um, we did have uh, uh, one recommendation. I know my my dad and I were talking about that. You know, given at the Indy Five Hundred, you know, one of the traditions is that you drink, you chug milk after you win the race. Maybe we could reverse that since. Um, you know, for our people that finished last or didn't make a prediction, they could chug some milk, perhaps in Indy 500 tradition. But just throwing it out there. And I, I just I have the supplies. That's where I go with. What's that? I, I I totally agree with the punishment. I would just uh, throw out there that if someone's going to be lapping theirs up slowly like a like an old dog, <laughs> that they'd be forced to chug twice. <laughs> yep. All right. Yep. Sounds let good. Me, let me go retrieve uh, milk. There you go. <laughs> go. The one thing I will say here is there's some controversy, okay? Pato Award was squeezed out. He was leading the race. And then this loser, Marcus Erickson, came in and tried to wreck him. It's absolutely ridiculous. And as Pato Award said, and as I will say, we will not forget this. <laughs> wow. All right. Bobby, that, that's, that's been the history of NASCAR and open wheel racing forever. Famous last words. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's, that, it, it only matters who wins, not how you got there. Yeah. I tell you what, though, you got to love these late race restarts. <clears throat> I mean, you just know. You just know there's going to be a wreck because a couple yeah. of guys are going to, they're going to just going to go for it. And it never ends well. Right. 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 That's true. Never, never pretty. Go big or go home. I mean, I was pissed that Erickson didn't win because I was fully expecting him to. And then at the end, he just lost. So, yeah, he deserved to lose. Well, uh, do our uh, our losers have milk prepared now? I think in Indy, <laughs> Indy 500 style, this should be a race. Yeah, it should be a yep. race. For, yeah, right. person, the person that does not finish theirs first has to do a second one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bobby, how, how many ounces do you have there? I don't think that's full. <laughs> um, they don't look like a full glass rock. around 12-ish. <laughs> 12-ish. You got to get that good old uh, Kansas milk glass full. <laughs> 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 Gentlemen, start your engines. <laughs> what happened? I don't know. John's Han Solo right now, so I don't know what's going on over there. <laughs> All right. You guys ready to move on? <laughs> That's right. He doesn't know what's happening. I don't. My camera's off. <laughs> you need to. I don't think they they didn't start your engines was not uh, interpreted as go. Yeah, it wasn't. No, right. Hey, I'm waving the green flag. Let's go. Go go go! Chug 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 chug. Oh, this is oh, oh that like was Nick one. Close. Whoa! Ah. Whoa! The I mean, he gets, to, he gets to go again. Jeez, yeah. <laughs> you you, you I think, earned I think the right to drink it. Boy. <laughs> Okay, another, my strong suit. Yet another board where uh, Wisconsin yeah. bests Minnesota. <laughs> we could we could make a compromise, Bobby. Maybe just chug a a beer to finish yeah. instead of milk for the second one. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'm good. So we 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 might want to inspect those containers before we go go further. But <laughs> wow, I was looking for a little more of a mess. But mm. That's right. You got yeah. Really dump it. Yeah, would have been would have been good for ratings. Yeah. <laughs> well, Bobby can do it again if we need something. <laughs> oh my gosh! Wow. Well, that's probably the first ever time I've ever seen people chug milk in a competition. So there you go, folks. Yeah. You only see it here. All right. Do we want to move uh, move on to um, our next prediction? Yeah, we do. Looking into the future, this weekend's U.S. Open, L.A. Country Club. A pretty cool venue. Tournament is not, uh, they haven't hosted a national tournament forever. They've had their membership has opposed hosting for decades and decades. Uh, now they're being a little more progressive. Reports are that it's an incredibly cool golf course. 
So I will lead us off. Um, I kind of, uh, I wish I did not have to name this person as the likely winner, but I uh, got to go with Brooks Kepka. You know, he won the PGA. His confidence level has got to be sky high when you look at um, where, where he was a year ago mentally and coming off some injuries. Um, he's had golf fans across the United States, at least, pitted against him. And he pulled out the PGA. And he's just the kind of guy, it, it kind of seems like, um, give him a little controversy, uh, give him a little disrespect, and he's going to get it done. And I just, I, even though I don't think this course is quite perfect for him, I think he's, uh, he's the guy to beat. Bob, what do you think? Uh, my sentiments are identical, uh, Charlie. Um, I'm not particularly pulling for him, but I have a feeling he's our most likely candidate. Any other Kepka endorsers out there? Yeah, I'm reluctantly, I have, I've got to, I got to take him. I think there's probably one in three chance he wins the whole thing. Yeah, he's just, he is just in his own right now, and he, he, he is, he is mentally tough. <laughs> It doesn't seem to, to matter to him that he's he's not a, uh, I'll say, a loved soul. But um, the guy can play, and he knows how to show up for majors. And he, he kind of gets it. He just So every day you just wipe out another share of the field until you get to the last day where only a handful of guys are in contention. And he's, he's mentally tough. I'd, I'd like to think that Scotty Scheffler – can hunt him down and, and knock him off or uh, um, maybe Rom. If, if Rom gets going, he'd be in a good place too. But right now, Kepka's hot and he's mentally in the zone. So I think he's the guy to beat. Got it. Ben, you know nothing about golf. What do you think? Well, you know, uh, I am uh, more of an expert than you think, Charlie. Okay. So, um, you know, just to give up my latest hot take, which will surely become correct soon. Uh, I would say that, you know, Scotty Scheffler is going to win. You know, last time he finished not in the top 10 was an event back in February. And he's usually, you know, just hanging around, um, always a contender. I think that, you know, he's overdue and he's going to get first again, finally, and win another tournament. Um, also for those who don't know, I'm not sure if we've mentioned this yet, but Scotty Scheffler was actually born in Ridgewood, New Jersey, which is really? um, where we have a lot of family from originally. In fact, uh, grandpa Bauman, uh, you know, was playing at the Ridgewood golf, you know, country club and, you know, won some tournaments there. So, you know, I kind of, Scotty Scheffler is kind of a connection there as well to him. So, uh, I'll be rooting for him and, and hopefully he can, he can get the, the W so. Well, with that thought in mind, here's a <clears throat> picture of our grandpa. There you go. Putting at Ridgewood That's great. Country Club. Yeah. I think he was like first flight champ one year. Yeah, you know, I don't know. At one point, I thought he was the champ. I thought he was like state am champ. I thought he played in the U.S. Open. Huh. I feel like mom and dad kind of. At least mom got a little twisted up on on what he actually accomplished, but well, I'm pretty sure he did like to golf. We he have, did, he, <laughs> we have he did have some trophies. Yeah, he, he did. did he did trophies. like to golf. Yeah. We we have I'm newspaper sure, I'm records. I'm sure he won him. something. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he he won some tournaments at the Ridgewood Country Club. He did. Um, yeah, right. we have it's in the newspapers if you go through okay. the old Ridgewood ones. But uh, so yeah, he's a winner. Um, and, <laughs> uh, there you go. So and so will be uh, Sky Sheffler. <laughs> Sounds good. Bobby, what does uh, your golf instinct tell you? I was pretty scientific on this. I'm going with uh, Dustin Johnson. Won in 2016. He is also married to Wayne Gretzky's daughter. <laughs> and with a Canadian finally winning the RBC, Gretzky is Canadian. Johnson married into the Gretzky family, which makes you Canadian by association. So I have Dustin Johnson. Also, I think the live guys are going to be walking with a little swagger because they basically got everything they want. And PGA guys are all going to be pissed off 
Uh, and I think uh, a live guy is going to win, and I think it's going to be Dustin Johnson. There we go. Nick, you're the longest hitter in the group. Yeah, I think it's going to be the uh, long hitters this week. Not not super uncommon for the U.S. Open. Um, but, yeah, really similar thoughts to Bobby. I think those live guys are going to be feeling good about themselves, um, especially Brooks Koepka. Um I'd imagine they're they're kind of playing. Well, they're already playing with house money, but it's it's like they're playing with house money. We get to go back in the casino again, so mm. I bet they'll be feeling pretty good. The last I saw, Kepka was like fourth or fifth in the betting odds, which actually surprised me a little bit. I thought he'd be higher. Um, who who are one and two? Rom you know, and I think Rom, I think Rom and Shuffler were. Another popular so. pick is uh, Max Max Homa. He's a Southern California guy who I believe holds the course record there. He shot like 61 en route to winning like the Pac-10 championship. So, and he'll be uh, he'll be a fan favorite there. Yeah, so Nick, some good karma carries over to him. Yeah. Do you actually have a prediction then? Like, who's your guy? Pick, my, pick my guy so is Okay. Okay. Got it. Good. Because we're going to have another pun punishment next week or next time. So <laughs> someone's got to lose again. <laughs> so we could be, uh, four of us could be punished. That would be great. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yep. Oh, by the way, before we move on from this segment here, I actually had some stats to share. I know that we've talked about in the past of sharing how we've been doing in terms of predictions historically uh -huh. so far in the show. I actually tabulated those and are able to present them to all of you today, which I'm sure you're excited about. Um, does anyone have a guess on who's done the best so far? I pretty much know for sure. Okay. It's me. Okay. Does anyone have a guess of who's done the worst? You? Well, that's hurtful, Charlie. All right. So I'm going to go through these uh, right now. We've done about, you know, depending on who's made predictions, you know, we not everyone has participated in every prediction historically so far, uh, maybe due to drunkenness or just negligence. Either way, everyone has been about, you know, around the 30s. But so I'm going to start from uh, worst to best um, in last place, though, it was incredibly offensive. Um, I am the last person. So Charlie was correct. Um, I have a whopping accuracy rate of 29% of my predictions are correct. Um, so I'm nine for 31. So if I was, you know, a baseball, you know, hitter, I would be doing pretty well. I'd be, you know, probably an all-star right now. So if you think of it that way, it's actually pretty good. Um, and okay. Next there's John who is at 33%. He's 10 for 30. Bobby is at 39%. He's 12 for 31. Nick is at 43%. He's 12 for 28. Charlie's at 52%. He's 16 for 31. And uh, Bob is at 53%. He's 16 for 30. So Oof. it's a nail biter there. That's a big spread. A lot of different stuff. So, but yeah. So we'll see uh, how things shake up after this next prediction. So. So, I mean, that goes way beyond uh, just random variation. I mean, that's, those are real differences. Well, those reflect you know, real, real differences in, a, in predictive ability. You know, I think that uh, it's still pretty early, though, Charlie. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, you know, get too carried away. I know that you've aged quite a bit mentally, and this may seem like, you know, you're the finish lines right there, but... <laughs> Just wait, there's plenty of predictions to go, and eventually I will surpass you as with everyone else. So stay the course to all my fans out there. Um, you gotta believe. <laughs> all right. All right. So we'll move on to our our last major segment here. We talk about what we've all seen new going on in the sports world that really struck a note of interest. You want to start us off, Bobby? Yeah, Stanley Cup Finals uh, very well may wrap up tonight. Uh, regardless, we're going to have a new Stanley Cup champion. 
Vegas Golden Knights, Florida Panthers. Neither team has won. Vegas up three games to one, though, um, and I think it's fairly likely they finish it up. Um, one other thing, Big Ten Conference announced recently that starting in 2024 for football, they're going to go away from divisions um, with UCLA and USC joining. Uh, so it's just going to be they're, they're going to be they're going to try to keep, you know, some of those conference rivalries intact. Uh, but for the most part, it's going to be more of a round robin type of structure. Um, and I am happy to announce that. In 2024, the Gophers will be going to the Rose Bowl. And we will be playing UCLA on the road. So I'm real excited for a Rose Bowl trip. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get the Rose Bowl somehow? <laughs> hey, Bobby, what, what happens with the Big Ten championship game? Uh, they're going to go with the top two. Top two. So whoever finishes in the top two, we're going to play each other. So yeah, we could end up with, you know, Michigan, you have, Michigan and Ohio State playing back-to-back weeks or something like that. Are they going to play in Indianapolis? Uh, probably to be determined, but wouldn't surprise me at all. It'd be fun to invite USC or UCLA to up to Camp Randall Stadium in early December for a game. Okay. Benny, what you got? Well, a few things here. Um, first off, as everyone – probably knows uh, the Denver Nuggets won the NBA championship, which none of us predicted, but I just want to shout out to uh, Christian Braun or Brown, who's on the Nuggets team. Uh, he actually won the national championship with the university of Kansas uh, recently. And he's also from Kansas originally. So that's kind of a cool connection. Um, he played, you know, solid minutes in the NBA finals. And um, so it'd be interesting to see where his career goes from here. But the really big story that I think uh, many Americans should be aware of, since it's going to be impacting their lives very soon, is that uh, Lionel Messi, um, arguably one of the greatest soccer, arguably the greatest soccer player of all time, depending on who you ask, is coming to the United States. He's going to be joining Inter Miami. Um, I can't say this enough, but this is the biggest, uh, you know, soccer signing in American history for a professional sports league in the U.S. When it comes to uh, soccer at least and, and really you could probably argue for all any sports because this is you know the world's game here so to get the you know best player in the world basically is pretty insane um, now some people may say like well what about you know in the past Pele came to the United States that's a pretty big deal however Pele was about five years removed from playing in the World Cup um, which was in 1970 is when he last played in the World Cup before he came uh, to play in the American Soccer League with the Cosmos in New York. Um, but, you know, Messi just won the World Cup for Argentina, leading there. Um, he's 35 years old, but he really has not aged much. He's still, you know, probably one of the best players in the world, if not, you know, some may say the best player in the world still. And um, also, you know, this is so huge for American soccer because a lot of players are now already talking about coming to the MLS to join him. And I wouldn't be surprised if more players come to just play in the same league as Messi. So this is going to be, I think, a potentially transformational moment, kind of like when David Beckham first came to the U.S., except bigger, perhaps it's going to lead American soccer to the next step and the next stage and kind of its evolution there. Also want to give kudos for, to Messi for rejecting what was, you know, $500 million a year offer from a Saudi Arabian club and instead taking you know, a, a much more minor, but still pretty impressive, you know, over a hundred million a year to play in the MLS. Um, so unlike Cristiano Ronaldo, his counterpart for another, you know, arguably greatest soccer player of all time, as well as basically all of golf at this point, um, Messi is not taking Saudi Arabian money. He wants to play uh, in the U.S. instead. So pretty cool. Good for him. All right. Bob, what do you know? Uh, just to follow up on the Messi signing and the, the question of soccer, uh, the last time soccer tried to make a big push like this was in the 1970s. And that is, as Ben alluded to, when Pele came to the United States uh, to play and uh, joined the New York Cosmos. Uh, Pele was quite a bit farther removed from his uh, prime as an athlete, and he only played a couple of seasons in, in New York. Uh, I happened to see the Cosmos at that time, who also had uh, Giorgio Canalia, a uh, 
fabulous international superstar from uh, from Italy. It just so happened, oddly enough, uh, that uh, when the North American Soccer League, uh, which was the American Big League at the time, uh, was forming, uh, they had to reach out and find places to play. And they established a team that was based at the Yale Bowl in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, the uh, Connecticut team, uh, only lasted uh, a couple of seasons before they either disappeared or, or moved to some other venue. Uh, but Pele and the Cosmos came to New Haven. Uh, Pele didn't even appear uh, in that game, but we got to see him warm up. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, I, I, I do remember that. Well, the messy thing though is, uh, is, is very big. It could have uh, enormous implications uh, down the road. And, and soccer is still a uh, rapid growth sport. Uh, in the United States, so bears watching. Um, something that's probably also going to slip by on the radar very quickly, uh, the University of Oklahoma women's softball team won their third straight uh, national championship, and uh, I think they finished with a 53-game winning streak, uh, which is just mind-boggling in a sport uh, like uh, softball, uh, which probably all of us have played uh, a little of at, uh, at one time or another. Uh, and also, in indication of uh, trends we've talked about, the star pitcher uh, for the uh, University of Oklahoma uh, the very next day announced uh, that she was transferring. Um, I will be interested to know if there's NIL money uh, involved. Yeah. She's going back to her home state of Nebraska. So huh. Huh. wait and see. Okay. Nick, what would you spot out there in the world of sports? Um, well, I was also going kind to of pay attention to soccer and uh, Leo Messi's contract. Um, I guess a couple interesting things about the intricacies of the contract itself um, that might have implications to um, sports contracts, you know, in other sports like basketball or football uh, or baseball. Um, so part of the deal is that he gets equity in Inter Miami, which is something that's new. Um, he also has the option to buy a franchise for $25 million. That's also different. Um, he's getting additional Adidas revenue chunks, um, but probably most interesting and, you know, change the way you might look at some of these athletes as, you know, content generators as much as anything is that. Um, so Apple TV, which has the rights to MLS, um, will now be given um, a portion of their revenue for MLS directly to Messi. Um, so this is definitely not traditional in the way that professional sports contracts um, have been put together in the past. Um, you might see different athletes who are, you know, the stars of their respective leagues remain similar, um, similar types of forms of payment. Um, but again, yeah, it's, you know, there's a reason. I'm sure there are reasons he'd probably turn down the, um, yeah, extremely lucrative Saudi deal, as before mentioned. Um, but I, I would be pretty confident he's getting well compensated over here, even if it's uh, beyond just his mm. you know, more standard contract components. Hey, Nick, Nick and Ben, uh, I think, Ben, you mentioned $100 million a year for Messi. Uh, it's around that range, but that's without yeah. all the other side deals that Nick okay. was talking about. So. so the other stuff is on top of that. So make, $100, million, $100 million a year, would that make him the highest paid team athlete in the United States? Um, I think so. Uh, I can't think of anyone who's making more than $100 million a year. I mean, and right. I think this, this just shows, you know, a lot of Americans take for granted how popular soccer is but it's coming it's it's you know it's you look at american society today and much more people are paying attention to soccer than they were in you know your guys generation you know my dad charlie john so um it's it's just gonna get bigger and bigger and the fact that he's already drawing in this much money i mean shows this is a, a game changer for how we think about soccer players in the u.s is there any hint that a major network would actually pick up soccer on a big time level. Seems like if, if, you, if you don't have a big time TV contract with a major network, it's it's hard to believe you can make the jump to really being a big time sport in the United States. I mean, I would say in the way that YouTube TV is going to have NFL Sunday ticket, um, I mean, that's going to be a relatively major network fairly soon, which wasn't thought of as being a major network recently. Um, I don't think it's a huge jump to say that Apple TV um, could be a major network um, in a way they aren't right now. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, like people who are millennials and, and younger, you know, no one's 
subscribing to cable anymore. It's it's all through streaming services. So YouTube TV is like the new cable. Um, you know, you can get cable through that and it's much cheaper even. Um, so a lot of people, if they're going to get cable, it's that, but a lot of people are just stream using streaming platforms and just deciding which ones they like. So um, I, I think that that is something that's also changing drastically in terms of what we think about as sort of mainstream networks now. Okay. Interesting to see. There's been a lot of talk about soccer for a long, long time. You know, finally catching on the U S maybe, maybe this will do it. Maybe Messi's uh, entry here will make a big difference. All right. On to Charlie. Well, speaking of money, uh, money spoke in a big way last Tuesday in the golf world, as you all know, um, probably not an episode has gone by where we haven't made some reference to the live tour. And last Tuesday, pretty much um, a shock to everyone in the sports world and everyone in even the world of professional golf. It was announced that the Saudi um, public investment fund would be creating a new entity that would basically fund the PGA Tour and the DP World Tour, which is really the European Tour, and live in what in essence is a merger of all three. Um, there are way, way, way more questions than there are answers today. Um, it appears that some of the dynamics at play are that the PGA Tour, although it's got the best players and it's got the best TV contracts, um, it may have been in a gradually weakening financial position. Um, it was paying out bigger purses to kind of uh, uh, keep up with the pressure from Liv. Um, and they were also facing a lot of lit litigation costs uh, by virtue of um, a Liv uh, initiated lawsuit. So um, they may have needed a little bit of a, of a life raft. Um, on the other hand, the Saudis, although they own the Live Tour, the Live Tour had a few good players, but for the most part, nobody was paying attention. So um, it seems like the PGA Tour, which needed money, and the Saudi um, Public Investment Fund, which wanted better players and attention and TV, um, they kind of, they, in a way, they had some complementary assets and weaknesses, and now they're together. Um, big questions going forward. Um, one is going to be whether it passes uh, muster on the antitrust front. Kind of interestingly, Liv, Liv had been suing the PGA Tour because it was behaving in a monopolistic way. So if the PGA Tour was behaving monopolistically then, well, now it's merged with its really only competitor. It would seem like now we've even got a worse monopoly. So there's that. Um, even if it passes antitrust uh, uh, muster then, I think a couple of big questions are going to be um, the PGA Tour guys that, that stayed loyal to the PGA, didn't go to live, didn't take the big money. They're kind of pissed off and they're probably going to need to be made happy in the form of um, some kind of payout. Um, so that'll be interesting to watch. Another interesting thing to watch is going to be how do um, these live guys get back onto the PGA tour? Because one of the kind of one of the bullet points of this merger is that there will be a pathway for them to do that. Um, that'll just be interesting to keep an eye on. Um, and then what does it, what does it all look like when it gets done? Is golf a more international game? Does the live tour exist in any form? Some people think it's just going to go away. So, um, the, what we know so far is, uh, minimal. Um, it's not sure that anybody really knows. I mean, even the, the head of the Saudi fund, and uh, Jay Monahan, who was head of the PGA Tour, is going to be CEO of this new entity. I'm not even sure they know at this point. So it'll just be, uh, it'll be pretty interesting to watch. Yeah, just kind of added a comment on that. Um, to, to your point, no, no one really knows what this is going to look like. But I, I think for, for a lot of people who follow professional golf, that was a sad day when that announcement was made. It, it's really hard to see how this does anything to grow the game aside, aside from just throwing money behind it. Um, certainly it does not align the, the values of 
professional golf or what golf is supposed to be um, with what you want it to be. Um, so from that, that standpoint, it's, it's, it's kind of disappointing. Um, there may be a lot of business reasons why it had to be done, but there may be some business reasons why it shouldn't have been done. So we'll just have to kind of watch how that plays out. Additionally, uh, certainly if the Saudis have, have already had has some interest in, in soccer, has some interest in, uh, in automobile racing, certainly now they, they see a path towards American sports in general. And I, I don't know, I don't know where that, that leads, but I, I don't necessarily think that's a, a positive thing for the sake of uh, the, the quality and the character of professional sports in the United States. On a happier note and more local note here, Steve Stricker won uh, the AmFam Senior Golf Championship. Stricker is a local Edgerton slash Madisonian. He's already won two majors on the senior PGA Tour this year, and he's eyeing perhaps another one, a third, at the U.S. Open that'll be held at Century World near Stevens Point, Wisconsin. And then hopefully he goes uh, across the pond and makes some noise in the British Open. But um, St Stricker is, is just the antithesis of what you talk about with, with Liv and you talk about with, with, with Saudi money. This guy is the real deal. He's a high character person. He represents the values of the game. And it's great to see somebody like that uh, having a lot of success on a professional tour. All right. Interesting, Interesting ad about Stricker is he, uh, he recently broke Tiger Woods record for round consecutive rounds of power better. Yeah. It's these yeah. like, I think it's like 54. So. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Quick question for you, John. Speaking of money and golf, uh, what are you doing next Tuesday? What am I doing next Tuesday? A week from today? Yeah. You've got an event. Tuesday, we have the grand opening of a little gem golf course uh, here in Monroe, Wisconsin. That is a 12-hole course that we have built within the first 12 holes of our existing course here at Monroe. Uh, going to be cool it's going to run about um what about 2200 yards over those uh, 12 holes uh gonna be a lot of fun brewing a lot of excitement here which is really kind of cool where we're kind of kind of breaking some new ground in, in golf when it comes to this part of the state and we're happen hoping that we're going to see a lot of kids out there a lot of families a lot of experienced golfers and very inexperienced golfers going out there and having some fun so, uh, yeah, that's, that, that, that's all good. And we're trying to hype it up a little bit. Um, uh, if any of you are around here and you got little kids with you and the kids age 12 and under get three hot dogs, we're going to have a live band and we're also going to have some, uh, for Badger fans, we're going to have some Badger celebrities down here, which will make it kind of fun too. So do you, uh, do you know what's going coming? on a week from today? Do you know who's coming? Uh, I... I do as of now. I don't want to jinx it. Yeah. But uh, for right now, it looks like it'd be, it'd be pretty interesting people down here. Sounds good. Yeah. Will the, excited will, about the, it. will the new course be playable that day? Uh, some of the tees will be. A number of them won't. We had sort of a, we had a lot of, a lot of wet weather, which prevented us from starting to build some of these new tees for Little Gem. And then we got dry weather, but so much dry weather, we've had trouble with our sod. So um, some of the course will be 100% playable and some will not. But all the uh, all the holes will be set up and marked out, and we're hoping to have some fun. Sounds good. All right. So that is the conclusion of our seventh edition of our SportsCast. Thanks for joining us, everyone. We'll see you in a couple of weeks.